Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, whether you are here uh, in the hall at Chatham House or whether you are watching us remotely. Um, my name is John Campton. It uh, gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this discussion this evening, the battle for truth, the BBC's role at 100, not the first centenary event that uh, the BBC has done this year, but one that we're going to be focusing particularly on issues around the BBC's role in the world. And we've got an absolutely illustrious panel, delighted um, to have uh, with us today, Tim Davey, known to you all as the Director General of the BBC, with whom I've worked uh, in different incarnations and always enjoyed doing so. Uh, Lillian Lander, um, Senior Controller, um, BBC uh, News International Services Director of the World Service. And Sarah Rainsford, who was until a short time ago in Moscow for the BBC and is, and she will um, talk uh, about um, those events and who is Eastern Europe correspondent uh, for the BBC um, having left Moscow. We're going to have a, a conversation uh, among ourselves uh, for around half an hour or just over and then we're going to throw it open to questions both from the hall and uh, also for any of you uh, listening and watching remotely, do prepare, do think about your questions. We want to very much focus this on um, the international role of the BBC and particularly this whole question of, as, I, as it says on the tin, the battle for truth. Um, Lillian, you wanted to uh, kick off with uh, just a couple of minutes really giving an overview of where the World Service is now and particularly at this vexed time for international relations. So before we have that discussion, I'll just hand over to you Thanks, and welcome John. everybody. Thank you. I thought it would be useful to give you an idiot's guide to the World Service. I know that you all probably would have listened to the World Service at three o'clock in the morning or when you were traveling, or however far or, or near. Um, there is a great deal to the World Service that you may not know, and I want to just take you through it very quickly. Um, the BBC turns 100 this year and the World Service turns 90. And what I want to do in that short time that's been allocated to me is take stock of where the World Service is, its reach, its funding, the recent changes, and ask a couple of questions of you, questions that have been preying on my mind lately. And I thought with an audience as illustrious as this, you may be able to help me. And that's quite genuine, really. So um, in, in the process, of the conversation, I will be addressing uh, soft power, but that will that will come through as well. So the world, the BBC as a whole, internationally, reaches 458 million people every week across the world. 350 million of whom are reached by the World Service, which is more than any other international broadcaster. The BBC World Service broadcasts in 42 languages, including English, and we are present in 70 countries. The World Service, as you may or may not know, is primarily funded by the license fee. The funding of the World Service moved from government grant in aid to the license fee in 2014. And at the time, the BBC committed to providing 254 million of annual funding to the World Service. This minimum funding commitment was removed as part of the latest license fee settlement, and it is now almost 300 million. So that's what we get from the license fee. Um, we also do get a grant in aid from government, 94.4 million per annum, and this is until 2025. Um, the World Service is on its way to becoming a digital first organization. I'm sure this will come out in the discussion. But we have decided to accelerate the digital transition in order to future proof the World Service, but also to move to platforms that our audiences are increasingly using. They are on smartphones, no longer on shortwave. So what does the World Service represent to those 365 million who consume us globally in 42 languages, including English? 
what is its value to the UK, what is its value to the licence fee payer, what is its value to the BBC, to BBC News, and what returns on investment? These are pretty kind of daring questions, but I think if one does not ask them in a, a, a group like this, one will never do. So what I want to gauge from you is what you think the World Service is. If it did not exist, would you invent it? Do you believe that the World Service is instrumental, should be instrumental in its projection of Britain's soft power? Give you a few facts and then I'll be done. Last year, the BBC commissioned research into the wider impact and influence of the BBC around the world, and the results were compelling. The BBC, one, is the world's most trusted and best known international news broadcaster. And if we want to talk brands, it is the most trusted news brand amongst mass audiences and influential audiences. And to confirm what I've just said, the Soft Power 30 Index in 2019 cited the BBC World Service as one of two British institutions that are key to British soft power. So would you want to guess which is the other one? The Premier League, absolutely. It's the Premier League and sometimes it's the monarchy. So... <laughs> depends who's in charge. It depends who's in charge. Well, it, okay, keep <laughs> Okay. So, so I would contend, though, that this soft power is incidental, that it is the product of the quality of our journalism and our editorial standards rather than the reason for its existence. So how do we frame the public debate? Is it about short-term benefits to the UK licence fee payer? Is it about long-term investment in journalism, a journalism that is impactful and trusted the world over? Of course, the two are not mutually exclusive. I would say that the trust that we have with our audiences has been built slowly and painstakingly over 90 years. Now, you know as well as I do that the World Service is a colonial creation. The Empire Service started in 1932, and BBC Arabic, which was the very first language service, was created to broadcast Britain's views to the Arab world in the late 30s. We're a long, long way away from this version of the BBC and this version of the BBC Arabic service. And the connection that we have forged with our millions of audiences around the world is incomparable. And most countries and broadcasters would give their right hand for a fraction of this audience. So yes, we are a unique asset. I won't be long now. And yes, there is alignment with British national interests. We do disinformation, we do fact-checking, we talk about democracy, about accountability, the role of China in Africa and Asia, climate change, global cost of living, what's happening in Iran, and of course, Ukraine and Russia. All these are issues that editorially preoccupy our audiences and that matter in an interconnected world. So I guess the aims of the World Service do go hand in hand with what the government wants in terms of soft power. But it's also what the BBC wants in terms of growing its audience and in terms of providing a service to people who can't get a balanced news service in any other way. So there's public service broadcasting at its very best. And that's me. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Leanne. That, that sets up um, my first question uh, very nicely. You said um, that uh, the BBC is in alignment with British national interest, and you cite the Soft Power Index uh, holding uh, up the BBC along with the Premier League as uh, the two great um, arms of, of British soft power. So my question uh, to you, Tim, is, is it the job of the BBC to project and to promote Britain? Um, I think Lillianne touched on it, really, which is the job of the BBC is to deliver its purposes. And that is journalism of the highest standard, programming of the highest standard. And that is absolutely brilliant for Brown Britain. So whenever I take a flight, I actually, by the, we, we don't have to do a good job sometimes of beating ourselves up. One of the things I would do in the moments of tough moments in this job is take a flight or a train 
um, and just go abroad and listen to people's view of what the BBC brings, which we can come to. But our job is, we do promote Brand Britain, but that's not what drives us. What drives us is the editorial standards. It's absolutely, we'll talk about it. We are, without doubt, in a ferocious battle for truth, to be clear. Um, we can talk about it. The threats are very, very significant. Um, but this institution, driven by purpose, and yeah, it's 100 years and what we now, eight days ago, that Reith and a couple of others um, actually, Reese was a bit joined a few weeks later because there's people in the room who know a lot about, more about the BBC history than I do, actually. But I know quite, and you know, they they came up with inform, educate, entertain, and did their business. And set, it's an unbelievable pioneering story, but it's based on values. It's based on there being more to life than money, and and that's what we do. And I think it's really clear, actually. It's not. Don't worry, by the way, that angst is not. It, it's not to me the defining challenge of our times our relationship to Brown Britain. Uh, it's, it's, are we able to deliver our mission in the midst of a highly polarising media market, enormous pressures, we're going to talk to Sarah, about actually having journalists on the ground. We've had journalists thrown out of China. We've got pressures in, I could list all kinds of countries, including free democracies. These are the kinds of things that occupy my mind, as well as hard cash. Because if you're going to do this, it requires funding. And we, we haven't got enough funding. So they're the things, John, that really I think the BBC and we as a group uh, need to focus on. I detect a slight difference in nuance between Brand Britain and Britain, or maybe I'm, I'm, I'm stretching it a bit, but what happens when the BBC comes in confrontation with British foreign policy national interests? I'm old enough to remember Kate Aidy and Margaret Thatcher. Uh, many of us uh, re remember the Hutton inquiry as well. Where does this alignment with British values and British goals begin and end when it comes in direct conflict with what well, we the know, government we know of the what, day no, wants? It's not, that, again, it's not. I mean, it, it's difficult. I mean, we get a lot. Of, we have a lot of stress with it, but our, 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 our mission is really clear: yes. to go after the truth. We're not. We're not there to uh, toe a line in that way. Or protect. Um, or exactly, to the or protect. Mm. I mean, you know, it's not, John, look, the history of the BBC, I mean, I think Reef once wrote, this is going to be uncontroversial. <laughs> um, this, this, we've always been at the, in the cross, crosshairs of this, but, but we have to be very strong around what we stand for. And we go after the truth. We go, you know, we have empowered journalists. We are not there as a propaganda arm of anyone. OK? And it's as simple as that. I mean, when I say it's as simple as that, the principle is simple. Your, your question is absolutely valid, because these things are struggles, nuances, all the... But we've got strong editors. We're, that's how we operate. We're an editorial entity. I mean, you know that. We're, we're an editorial entity, and the editorial values of the BBC are sacrosanct, and they stand above everything. There is, to, to Lillian's construct, there's a net effect of that in terms of the reputational advantages for the... Because, look, the clue's in the title. That mission I've talked about builds trust. And what people value is that trusted journalism. It's the very thing that you're pushing at, which is quite right, to put, is that we're, we are trusted because of that purpose and because of our independence to government in the way we report. It's sacrosanct. I mean, I, I don't... I, don't I, I feel no um, compromise about that or, or there's, there's no lack of clarity about that in the BBC. Uh, completely. C completely and absolutely. I don't think that we would have 458 million who would come back week after week after week to the BBC if they did not trust in the absolute uh, robustness of the BBC's news, its independence, its accuracy, its impartiality. They're not cliches. These are not words that we kind of, you know, repeat because we like them. This is, this is the, the reality of us reporting on issues that are extremely hard. And day by day, we ask ourselves, what is impartiality? Where should we be on this issue or that issue? We're doing Iran, we're doing Ukraine, we're doing Russia, and we do the UK. And th this is quite important that Incidentally, the strength of our journalism makes us one of the most best-known products in the world when it comes to Britain. It's incidental. That is not our purpose. Our purpose is to do the journalism that we do so well. I think, sorry, John, if I may, I think it's really interesting. Is, is because 
there are deep challenges to what I've just said, because if it sounds in any way glib, ah, oh, we've got a purpose of that. You know, this is a, our journalism is a result of a process, editorial guidelines, rigor. Think, now, in a world in which I've seen research that most 16 to 34s don't believe anyone can be impartial. Mm. Anyone. Everyone's got a point of view. We, we are having to do more to, to actually demonstrate our intent. Because in, in a polarised kind of social media world, everyone ascribes intent. So if you ask a tough question of one side in politics, you are coming from the other side of politics, as opposed to being a robust journalist after the truth. With that, you quickly get into a, a Twitter world into ascribing of intent. So in my email, I'm either a kind of right-winger taking over the BBC or I'm a woke left-wing activist, yeah? You, seriously, I mean, people want to badge you. And the badge we're wearing is different, which is we're wearing a badge which is we're trying to get the truth and we want to be impartial. We're not perfect. We make mistakes now and again. We don't get it right. We have to manage things. But by and large, in thousands and thousands of instances, we're getting it right through process and rigour. But that is... You know, I have to say, it feels a little bit of a unique course when I travel around. We seem to s stick out like a sore thumb in trying to hold that course. But we're going to hold it. Sarah, uh, Tim used the term, the word crosshairs. You were right in the crosshairs. You became the story when um, you were thrown out, you were expelled from Moscow. I want to ask you this. Do you believe it's the job of the BBC to promote liberal democracy? Um, is there a legitimacy, uh, is there a hierarchy of legitimacy? Um, the, or is liberal democracy, as practised in the UK and in uh, many other countries uh, around the world, but in retreat, um, just one of several competing ways of organising society, and the BBC's job is to give them all fair airtime. So you, you're right in the heart of it in Moscow and uh, reporting from different places in, in Ukraine. There is a war in which to the, the views of uh, most right-minded people, there is a pernicious aggressor and there is a country that is being invaded. How do you nav navigate this question of, of legitimacy? Um, I think, first of all, I don't see it as my job to promote anything. I think my job is to reflect what's happening and to interrogate what's happening <coughs> and to, to report what's happening. I'm not there to promote Britain or its values. I'm there to, to look at the country I'm currently reporting from and what's happening on that occasion in that place. Um, I would say just one thing, just reflecting on what, what um, the others are saying, that there's no better way of understanding what the BBC stands for than to work in a country like Russia, where the truth is criminalised um, now. I mean, it's always been extremely difficult as an environment for, for journalists to work in or for any critics of the Kremlin to work in, as, as we all know. But um, this past year has shown just how dreadful it can become. And people are currently in jail because they simply referred to what's happening in Ukraine as a war and talked about people being killed there and talked about war crimes being committed there. So when you work in that environment where there is no understanding of the role of a free press, then it's really interesting for me to come back to the UK for the first time in 20 years and see these debates about what should the BBC be, um, kind of massive criticism of the BBC for various things, and, and I personally kind of getting flack for, for what my colleagues are doing. And this debate that's happening in, in, in Britain is extraordinary because it couldn't happen in Russia because there's just no concept of anything like the BBC. It's extraordinary in a... In a are you worried about the debate? Sometimes I've, I've had sort of shouting rows with you just don't know how lucky you are kind of de de conversations with my friends because, you know, coming from a place where, where all of my Russian-speaking independent journalist colleagues have had to leave the country if they wanted to carry on with their job, it is extraordinary to come back to, to Britain where we have this, this, the BBC and a plethora of other, other journalists doing amazing work uh, and see that people don't necessarily value that as I wish they would. But it's not my job to lecture them, it's for them to understand that. And, and, and maybe things like what's happening now in, in Russia and in Ukraine helps to bring that into sharper focus. But when you are being challenged in Moscow, uh, when you were being challenged, and Steve 
now your your former colleague and and many others reporting there. It, it's surely a temptation to sort of almost because you are being challenged and threatened uh, so consistently, to sort of see, set yourself up as, as, as the other voice, as the counterpoint, as the counterpoise to, to whether it's fake news, to whether it's, it's um, uh, you know, imprisoning people, hitting them on, on, on the head, almost to become, you know, the other voice, the dissident voice. Well, I mean, if the alternative to being the dissident voice is, to ref is purely to reflect the Kremlin's position, then, then yes, I would say my, my role is to, is to reflect the voices that aren't reflected within Russia, definitely. It's to, it's to show what's happening beyond the propaganda that Russia is projecting within the country and outside, so that Russians and people outside Russia get a full picture, not just the, the message that's coming from the Kremlin. So yes, it is to be a counterpoint in that sense. But it is also to try to help people outside Russia to understand Russia as well. Um, so not to, not to simply kind of be a voice for, you know, a, a kind of megaphone for, for Russia's voice, but to interrogate that, but, to, but certainly to try to put it in the context of my, in my case, 30 years of, of studying Russia. So it's, it's a complex role, but, but um, it's not, I don't think it's to represent anything apart from freedom, truth, freedom of choice. Russia itself, in its constitution, gives, the, gives its people those rights. So if there are people who are being imprisoned for that, then I do think it's my job to, to certainly to report on that and to, to tell Can people. I say something about the, yeah, and let me the, just, the dissident's voice? This and and also, if, if, if you would, the point about the hierarchy of legitimacy, is the role of the BBC and the BBC World Service to be the voice of liberal democracy in a hostile, difficult no, world? No, I mean, the, the, the BBC World Service does the job uh, that all its journalists do, which is to report... Uh, to analyse, to inform. This is what the BBC World Service does. So it's through its sheer editorial power that it, it, it does what it does. But uh, let me come back to the dissidents also because it's very important in terms of what's happening at the moment in Iran. We've got quite a big Persian service which has been completely in the eye of the storm mm. uh, in terms of the events in Iran. And this is because they re they have been seen not to be the dissident's voice. They have been seen to have stayed impartial. They have been seen to have reported the news as they should. They fact-checked. They interviewed people from both sides of the argument, etc. And they have been under huge and momentous attack on social media by the opposition. Why? Because they did not stand up as the voice of the opposition. And they're being attacked by the opposition from... It, it, it's a pincer movement. The opposition that says, what do you mean impartial? Well, that, that does not exist. You've got to take sides. And the regime that has, for years and ever since its creation, been harassing our journalists and demeaning our journalists, uh, journalism. So th this is where we find ourselves when we uh, continue to occupy the ground of we report the news impartially because we want to inform you audiences, not just in Farsi, but in English as well on what is happening in Iran. And there is the spincer movement because they are expected to be behaving as the voice of the dissidents and the opposition. And we're not. We're not, in, in as much as, you know, we are not the voice of Britain and we are not the voice of Ukraine. And we, you know, we are there to, 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 to delve into the news, to unpick it, to report it, to be completely transparent and rigorous about it. I think, John, when you, just building on this, I think the, you talked about the hierarchy of legitimacy. I think where you get to have this conversation is we do have some values we stand for, freedom, truth, uh, that sit at the top. But that does stop at, you were saying, methods of government. We, that's not where we are. We're, we're shopping slightly higher. But we do, we do have, I mean, we, we, are in a, we do have an opinion around, you know, fake news versus truth. These are very simple things. They're simple. For, and that, that is enshrined in what... Now, my, my feeling is the pressures on us to deliver that. And by the way, there's always been pressures if you look at the history. Of the, I mean, the one thing 100 years does, you, you can reflect things in the long term. What is changing, by the way, on our watch together, we have seen, you know, if you look at the latest data, 73% of the world's population does not live in a situation where they have a free press now. It's really sobering. In the latest uh, studies, only 22% of the world's population live in a free democracy. Now, I'm not championing particularly one method of government, but it does give you some clues in terms of, to Sarah's point, what, what kind of 
functioning society they have. And in that context, we are, we are facing, and social media adds so much, you know, kind of angst to this. We're facing a really demanding situation in terms of the choice to just keep with the truth. And, and you can hear exactly, we're having it all the time, which is you've got to take sides. You've got to be, this pressure, and, and it, it's very interesting, I mean, if you look at something like in the US where we're now the most trusted news source. We've got good scores, but actually a lot of them have fall, <laughs> fallen away into, into the polarised camps, and we're left, you know, it's an incredible position, actually, if you look at our, our latest numbers on news. And by the way, if you want a slight ray of optimism um, on a Tuesday night, it's, it's that actually we're growing. By the way, these numbers that Liliana's got, we've got really good numbers. I was looking at our numbers for October 22 in terms of the number of unit users in the BBC. It's growing. So we definitely have a place. But, you know, it would be interesting, for instance, CNN, you know, taken over now in the Warner Discovery merger, they've said they're going to try and get back to impartial news. That, that'll be an adventure in time and space for them because it's going to be tough. Well, now that we're on America, we've been talking previously about out-and-out -out dictatorships and, and governments that um, mm. uh, egregiously harass and imprison um, people who try to uh, spread the uh, objective information, uh, news, whatever. But America is, is, is surely a test case. And you talk about 73% of people living in unfree countries. America is still... Notionally, not, not having a free press. Like not having understand. a free press. So where are we on the United States? The BBC does talk about the, uh, uh, the claims that the uh, last elections were rigged as being there is no evidence for it. it, is, it you know, um, it's very legitimate on that. What happens with an, a second incarnation of Trump or somebody like Trump? Uh, where you have American uh, state governors general that declare uh, results to be different to what they otherwise might be, and you have a completely bifurcated country. How does the BBC navigate that, uh, where you have people telling blatant falsehoods? And of course, as I say, the BBC has been very good on that one specific point, but it's much more than that one well, specific point. I, I mean, personally, the others might have view. I mean, huge opportunity, by the way. What an opportunity, as I say. I mean, in terms of, and, and by the way, I, I think there's enormous amounts of people in the US who are desperate for trusted news, who are very, very interested in. John, there's not, I'll answer in generics, because you just go, I mean, everyone's talked about it. You just go off the story in the trees. It's old fashioned journalism in terms of what, I, I, I think it becomes so much harder for the individuals in the middle of the storm, that's what I would say. The amount of noise around them, the pressures, you know, the jobs, that, but this could be, uh, you know, political editor in Scotland, or it could be political editor in, you know, American editor. The pressures around people um, and their abilities to just do, if you like, proper work in terms of where the truth is and trying to ascertain the facts becomes extremely hard. Um, and we just need to hope. But we, we, we have a decent record of this. And, and I think we, we, I remain optimistic we can keep on that brief. I the really 2016, do. let me just... Uh, yeah, okay. push you on this. A 2016 Brexit referendum, do you think the BBC covered itself in glory in I, terms of fact-checking as rigorously as it otherwise might have done? I think we did very well, and but there were learnings. Okay, so if you actually look at what we did, rather, there's a lot, it's interesting this, because you get a lot of noise around your coverage, then we went and looked at our coverage. Actually, there was quite a lot of analysis of some of the claims. There was quite a lot of work done. I think with regard to the UK, because you're in a def and, and this, this is, when I talk about, you know, people know that when I came in, I, I made a very big choice because I could see other organisations that claimed impartiality beginning to, I think, drift to one side of the fence or the other, be caught in this. The culture wars as a whole another dimension, which, which is another evening's discussion. But all of that led to enormous pressures on people wanting to just be impartial and get to the truth. Um, the vulnerability, t I think, you are vulnerable in instances to what I'd call groupthink. Yeah? Um, what do I mean by that? 90, in surveys, 96% of creative industry leaders at a senior level supported, um, I think that was, might be one of your surveys, John, there you go, uh, supported wanting to stay in. Yeah? Now, you, you just, however good your intent is, you're going to have, are you making sure you're truly hearing for the widest 
number of voices are you... Now, the BBC is good, by the way. It's got real outreach into 39 local radio stations. It's got an incredible presence. It's, I, I think it did a good job. But some of those, I have to say, some of those things where you sense, OK, maybe we just got caught now and again on looking at life through a certain lens, no doubt, that's a risk. But I, I think there's a, if I may... They yeah, are, but I, I was talking not so much about groupthink. I was talking about not calling out politicians who told blatant <laughs> porky pies. Well, with, with, I think overall we do a pretty decent job of that. That's what I would say. Yeah. I mean, uh, and sometimes you can't get to... You know, I, we do a lot of... By the way, you, you, this audience will know more or less... One of our hit podcasts at the moment is the uh, ec Economics Explained. Yeah. It's absolutely huge, by the way. The desire, John, it's a really interesting point, by the way, and we probably have learned a little bit since Brexit, that just explaining things, understanding some of these numbers that are thrown around, and certainly our new head of news, um, Deborah Turnis, is very, very focused on how do we underneath these claims and these traits. So I think there's more we could do, frankly. Um, Can I so, just say yeah. very quickly, just come back to your point about uh, America, uh, and I, I'm sure you know, but if you don't, I'm going to say it, that we've got millions of audiences in the States who take the World Service because they see the World Service as far more impartial and aiming for the truth, whatever we mean by the truth, mm. than their own broadcasters. And the um, controller of World Service English is here and could give you a song and dance about how how well we have uh, done in America and still doing Absolutely. in America. I mean, one of my bugbears with the BBC, and everybody's got their bugbears with the BBC, is, um, I mean, it's... it's I feel it's like made, in the pub now. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, um, it's, it's made great strides on the nations and regions, but apart from the one or possibly two running international stories, I'm sure you'll tell me that I don't have my facts right, there appears to be in the domestic services far less international coverage um, than rival broadcasters. I mean, German TV on a Sunday night would lead on the Polish elections. You know, in, mm. a, in, a, in a British domestic uh, 10 o'clock mm. evening mm. news wouldn't even have the Polish mm. elections. If we could generate, let if we could let generate let a little less domestic news, then we might have a bit, we, we um, might have a bit more space, John. But anyway, so, it's another well, story. Well, I mean... I, that, that, that's, that's a very important point that you're making, and I would be very interested to see what your audience thinks of that. Yeah. I mean, do people think that the BBC is not domestically as internationally focused as it should be. Um, I, I know because I watch in French and I watch in German, and yes, you're absolutely right. But, you know, we, we, we've got so many big and important stories at the moment domestically, and I'm seeing myself now defending kind of BBC domestically. Of course, I, w I, I would love to have a foreign story heading the agenda every single day. Would you like the World Service output to be better projected and promoted in the UK for a course, UK John. audience? Why, why, why is it not? <laughs> I, 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 th I think broadcast is... Well, I'll, get to, I'll get some opportunities around that, John, which is I don't think the, if you talk to the editor of the 10, the 6, the Today programme, they are, they've got a you know, deliberate strategy. They've got a strategy to serve their audience. Yeah, there's no rationing of international news in any way, shape or form. They are smart editors making calls on what the stories of the moment are. And actually versus other outlets with our, I mean, we can be very proud of our international coverage, you know, the, the, the correspondence we've got around the world. So I, I, I don't think I need to be defensive about that. What I would say, by the way, is digital, digital ink, massively increases the opportunity to bring news to people. I mean, this is where the BBC actually, rather than being a threat, because you feel like linear, traditional media op operations are like besieged by the threat of digital and transition, if we really could make it work, because the BBC's strength is often its depth. If you go, by the way, to Truro, the Cornish team will say, you just don't surface the stories properly that we do, and some brilliant journalism, yeah. just as you would with the Nigerian service, et cetera, et cetera. One of the things we hope we can do, and this is a, this is a delicate balance because you don't want it to be fully personalised, is we can be in a point where we can kind of push up our journalism and actually tailor it a lot more. Um, and that gives us a real opportunity because some of the best reporting we have done, best investigations we've done, the glowing examples of the BBC at its best are actually coming through the World Service. There's absolutely no doubt about that. Yeah. Sarah, let me ask you, um, RT, um, in the old Cold War, Russian and other uh, 
new services coming from dictatorships were just not very good. They talked about five-year agricultural plans and the harvest had gone up by 7.3% and that sort of thing, which isn't designed to um, keep the audience. Um, RT's production values are incredibly slick. Um, it's, uh, if you looked at it, you would think, uh, well, they are throwing money at it and it's actually very good. So it's a much greater challenge, is it not, that... Uh, the BBC and other equivalent news organisations face an alternative that is, as I say, it's slick, it's professional, it just gives you a slightly different take on events, to be polite. Um, how do you... Um, what's your assessment of that? How do you navigate that? And how do you think people in third countries, which, you know, if you're in a hotel somewhere or, you know, in the global south or wherever we are being constantly bombarded with Chinese and, and, and Russian TV. Yeah. Um, how, how, do you, how do you deal with that? I, I think it's depressing. I mean, the number of hotels you go to and you find RT as the main English language uh, channel. And I still like to call it Russia Today because hiding behind yeah. RT is a okay, bit of a... <laughs> I mean, they call themselves RT, yeah. but they yeah. are Russia Today. Yeah. Um, but that's part of their whole whole game, isn't it? To, to hide who they are and what they're doing. So, they, I mean, I remember when they first started up and I remember in Moscow... Uh, a whole bunch, of, a whole new kind of wave of, of uh, foreign um, wannabe journalists pitched up in Moscow, paid huge amounts of money to, to, to front up um, RT, Russia Today, uh, as it definitely was then. Um, and they didn't really know what they were getting into. They hadn't got a job before, had a job before. They were paid lots of money. They thought it was real journalism. They were sitting on really fancy sets. Um, and and at, at the begin, in the beginning, they were doing relatively normal stuff um, but it changed and I think you only need to look at the the social media platforms of the the editor-in-chief of RT uh, Margarita Simonian to know mm. exactly what RT is and so therefore um, you know I think um, I, I watched RT and other Russian state media propaganda channels in 2014 in Ukraine essentially starting a war um, so I think to have any kind of rosy tinted spectacles and talk about other perspectives, questioning more, giving different people the floor and platforms and all that stuff is, is one way of presenting what RT is doing and has been doing for years. But another way is to look at what happened in Ukraine in 2014 and what's happened ever since then. And unfortunately, they're as culpable as every single one of the other state media uh, channels that exist in Russia. It's part of the same package, it's part of the same machine, and it has produced what's now happening in Ukraine today. I think audiences internationally see through RT. I'm not sure they do. You don't? No. Internationally? But, but I wanted to say something else, which is that in five years' time, RT will not be that important and that interesting because it will be digitally that people will be getting their news from, whether it's RT or They're CGTN. pretty canny and digitally as well. Yeah, I mean, that, they, that's are. The they, they are. They but, are, but, you know, it, people don't go to RT digitally. They get onto Twitter and then they, or, or Facebook or Instagram or TikTok. That, that, that I'm, I'm I sure. think, is the danger, rather than RT sitting in hotel in hotel. Yeah, but I mean, the, the uh, editor of, of RT calls Putin her boss, yeah. Nachalnik. Yeah. He's yeah. her boss. Yeah. Uh, she, it's, it's a and sort of joke, but it's not really a joke. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and her latest um, Telegram platforms have been genocide or hate speech. So I, I just think you have and to know that. And people don't see through that. I, I'm. Some people love it. She's, you know, has a huge number internally. of followers and supporters. Mm. Not, not just internally. No, that, yeah. I think that's important to know. It's we're, not just. Internally. We're going to come to questions in a second. Just um, a very quick uh, further question to you, Tim. Going right back to the beginning, we're talking about Britain and the brand. So the British brand, the British political brand. I'm not inviting you to comment on it because I know you won't. Um, has not been uh, in, in the greatest of odour of the last six or nine months. Um, is the BBC affected, to so the reverse, is the BBC affected by the strength or weakness of brand Britain? So if Britain is being disparaged around the world, is that completely separate I to the seen, BBC's I reputation? I just haven't seen any evidence of that. You know, we're, we're having a... Our numbers are strong, actually. I mean, you know, we've got lots of challenges, but our numbers are strong. And generally, when I go around the world, people... Um, what's the right phrase? They may be... Um, Bemused. Intrigued was what, it, what I was going to say. It's, in, yes. it's better, Lillian. Intrigued yeah. Yeah. by what's been going on. Yeah. But actually, they, they, you know, we've got 100 years' history here. Um, so you, I think, you I will think outlast also that, 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 this trust? Um, yes. Um, but the, the, I mean, there's one point in, just in terms of in, in the opening remarks, which is 
I, I think that what they also see is because of this environment we're in, you know, where truth is becoming more vulnerable, it just is more vulnerable. It's harder to get to. There's just so much noise that they are beginning to reflect on what they care about. I mean, if I'm being an optimist, there are... I mean, by the way, I do see it, the Russia Today and the Chinese investments as a serious threat. I think the... I'm going to say more about this over time, I think, but I, I think the, the UK does need to decide how much it wants to invest from the FCDO and the governmental side in terms of supporting the World Service, because I think there's only so much we can ask a licence fee pay it in Penrith to pay for language services. They do provide a benefit and money coming back, but I think at the end of the day, this is a strategic decision for the UK. And those two economies have decided, for better or worse, that it's a big strategic decision that over time they're going to build soft power. And media is a very significant part of that. So the BB and, 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 and there is absolutely no doubt that with the resources we've got, we do an spectacular job in my mm. view and that's not me that's mm. me being very proud of the teams and we do a spectacular job in terms of bang for buck mm. uh, and I think the case is overwhelming the, the last thing I'll say is that there's a really uh, essay that, that I'd recommend which is Jonathan Haidt that many in the room may have may know I, it's, it, I'll get the title wrong but it's on the Atlantic it's called something like the, the, why the last 10 years have been the stupidest in American history and it talks about social media and what it does and it, and it, and it says what are the things that hold a democracy together and it talks about social capital, strong, institution, strong institutions, and shared stories. Mm -hmm. It's not a bad list. It's not a bad list if you're in my job. And I, I, I actually think we've got a big choice. I think, I think at the moment, we're, de we're defying gravity with our investments. Um, but we've got to decide the game is getting tougher. And there are big scale competitors out there. And believe me, they, want, they, they may or may not be successful. I, I share both the worry and a little bit of your optimism, Lillian, in terms of, but I do think we need the resources to take it on. Right, uh, questions. Uh, we got microphones, Where are we, we got the mics coming up. Right, let's, um, let's, let's, gosh, there's so many. Uh, right, let's start at the back, uh, gentlemen there. Thanks, yep, yep, thanks. And then uh, lady here, and then lady here in the second row, right. And we'll take three together. And if you could please keep them incredibly short. Thank you, because we've got a lot to get through in not much time. Uh, hi there. Um, so my question is, what, what would you say is the biggest threat to the future of the BBC? Would it be political polarization, funding, or atomized consumer habits and consumption of the media? Thank you. Uh, just uh, here, thank you. In, and then the second row. And then we'll, we'll take, the, we'll take them in threes. Yes. Um, hi. I, I would just preface by saying I love the BBC. You provide enormous value. Thank you. However, um, the critic. <laughs> There's always the a bar. I have a lot of conversations <laughs> like this for right? yeah. But the criticisms about um, the notion of impartiality don't just come from outside the organization. You know, you've lost some incredible journalists like Andrew Marr, like Emily Maitlis, like John Sopel recently, who seem to feel they were restricted by that notion of impartiality. Um, so, given what you've rightly identified as the threats um, and that, you know, we are in a battle for truth, is that notion of both sides restricting that battle, restricting the, the BBC in that battle? They're two such big questions. I think we should just go for those t to begin with. Let's, let's start with this one here about impartiality and big BBC beasts leaving because they are not given the voice that they are given elsewhere. I think I'm, I'm very happy with the talent we've got. Sorry, that's the politician's answer, but you know what I'm saying. I mean, I think we're, we have we, a few people have left, not many. If you look at our numbers, and the quite a lot from the news and current affairs. It's about three percent of presenters, John. If you want the yeah, facts, yeah, okay. Three percent, and we've got we've got the A team in place, and I'm very happy with our lineup. But there is a, there's a something in the question which I do agree. So some people will choose with with what we set as the parameters for the BBC that they over time may want to go away. And to be fair, I mean Andrew's done an amazing career, brilliant journalist, but he want he was very he said I want to go and offer a view. That's fine, no problem. You know, this is, and also, we are a grower of talent. I don't want the whole place to be stuck. There's something in your question, by the way, about this two sidism, which I think is slightly different, but relate, actually, slightly different. I'll put it that way. 
which is true impartiality is not just the seesaw, you know, here's one, here's the other. It's contextualizing the whole, and often, you know, just these more clunky ways of dealing with the issue doesn't get to truth. So I think that is a profound conversation that's going on in the BBC and important. Um, op option three, by the way, it's relevance. Everything else is secondary. <coughs> If you don't have an audience, and if we can't support a universal model in the UK, and we're not currently, we're used by 88% last week. 90, this week will be a 90% because England are doing okay. Um, if we hit 90% of the population a week in the UK, we'll be okay. The issue is to do that through an internet distribution, the atomized nature of internet distribution, not through fixed distribution. And that's what the internet does. It did it to black cabbies outside. It did it to every business. Navigating that course and having the right investment to take you across that bridge is the central challenge. It's relevance. More than any political noise, that I, I think a lot of BBC watchers focus on the wrong thing. And that's where I'd be. Sarah, I want to ask you that. Can I just say very quickly? Yeah. I know Sorry, I'm constantly I'm coming in. No, no, no. It's about the two sidedism, which is so much not the definition of impartiality. No. Impartiality is, is such a painstaking thing. We, we <laughs> labor day in, day out to get to a notion of impartiality that we're happy with on a daily basis. So it's not I, I, give, a, I give a Muslim and I give a Christian and I'm happy I'm being impartial. Not at all. It is not that. It is what we try and do and what we strive for. And sometimes we get it right and sometimes we don't. As for the talent, I, I have a hell of a lot of admiration for the Andrew Mars and, and Maitlis and John Sopel. You're absolutely right. We still have some very good people too. But this is not impartiality. And I do not think that people have left because of impartiality. Sarah, you've, you've obviously lost um, some good colleagues along, uh, along the way the last few years. It's putting you in a difficult position because you've got your, your two bosses on, on, on your right. But um, do you sometimes feel restricted in, in what you can say? You've, you've seen so much, you're whatever. <laughs> you're making me Just nervous, Lillian. <laughs> yeah. um, I think I, I've never worked in, in the UK, so um, I don't know what it's like to work as a journalist in a UK political At Westminster, environment. Yeah. yeah, I have yes, no right. idea, and or I think it would be a completely different yeah. world yeah. to, although I'm sure Good the point. values, et cetera, is all the same, but uh, it's a completely different world, and your scrutiny you're under is completely different <laughs> to what yeah. my life has been as a foreign correspondent. So um, I would start by saying I don't really know. But I, I think it's always interesting uh, and surprising to people um, that I talk to about my work that people don't understand how actually free editorially yeah. I am in my job, yeah. and I'm not saying this because they're here, but, yeah. but I mean, I, 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 our scripts are not checked, really. I mean, I'm talking about just new scripts. Right? I'm not talking about something which might be contentious, which might need referring up to somebody editorially for proper kind of sign-off. But generally speaking, if I write something, it goes on air. If I say something, it's not checked. We're not, our, our two ways, our, our, our interviews or whatever um, with presenters are not, are not pre-discussed, you know, you just, the, the questions are chucked at you, you answer them, you say what you think, you say what you know, they respect your, your experience mm -hmm. and your knowledge. And that's not what it's like, even in somewhere like Spain. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's a very, very, I feel like it's a very <coughs> unique working environment, and it's why I'm still at the BBC after 20 odd years. Um, and because it's the thing that I value more than anything, it's that the fact that you can be respected to have you know, brought all your, your editorial kind of um, thinking to a, a story and to a situation and that you'll be trusted mm. to take that information and, and to tell people what you believe to be accurate and true. Right, let's take some more questions. Lady, uh, yeah. oh my goodness, we're going to be here is till it, midnight. Is it on? Right, uh, go, go yeah, ahead. Okay. Yeah. So first of all, uh, congratulations for 100 years and also for the tremendous achievement. And what I'm saying now, it's a part of an answer for both you and Lillian. Uh, it's not only 190 hundred, uh, 90 years, it's also 30 years, 3-0, when BBC World Service and Foreign Office started an exceptional ambitious program. Can we just for, can, can we get to your question, yeah, please, very quickly? We've got it's lots very of important, really. Thank you. Uh, inviting young journalists from ex-communist countries to join and training program, extensive one, yeah. which implies a huge financial and logistic effort. So bringing the journalists to the UK and showing them what does it mean a free press, a responsible yeah. press. So this is an answer. And now the question is, do you have a report on the impact of this program? Right. And are you continuing that? 
Good, thank you. Uh, gentleman there at the back and then uh, all the way at the back there on the side. Thank you. And uh, then gentleman there in the second row. Uh, 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 I'm doing this quite randomly, right? <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. Thank you, John. Um, my name is Yusuf. I'm from the Africa program here. Um, my question is in relation to the changes to the Africa service. Um, I think initially I should say that the move towards putting more Africa-based journalists on the continent themselves is a fantastic one which you, do, which you should be applauded for. However, I am concerned and we are concerned about the move to digital causing some level of elitism to go into who accesses your coverage because the reality of it is internet penetration isn't fantastic, quite expensive. Therefore, what are your thoughts in relation to that question itself and, and what you know, guarantees can be made because the concern really is, especially for the African audience, yep. the impact of the BBC is immeasurable. And I really would like an answer to that. Lillian, those, those two questions belong to you. So okay. th thank you for this. No, we have not followed on with this programme, but I will go back and see whether we can get a report on this. It's, it's fascinating, and thank you for asking the question. Yusuf, uh, we have had to make cuts in Africa, as we have had to make cuts elsewhere, uh, including BBC Arabic and, you know, the big beasts. What we are doing in Africa is not just moving completely to digital. We still have uh, radio programs in areas of the continent that we know are not at the moment able to access digital or data. But we also have an example of India where from practically one week to the next, data became so cheap that there was an explosion of people wanting digital, being on their phones, etc. And we know that this is going to happen on the continent. We do not know when. So we are putting in place the, the, the structure that will enable us to move digitally as, as soon as data becomes available to people, but we have not done away with radio. You know, we know that in some areas of, of the continent, radio is still absolutely essential and crucial. But we've had to make some difficult choices. You're right. You're absolutely right. There's a few patient people in this, in this row. Let's, uh, gentlemen there, uh, yeah, right there, yeah, and then the gentleman just ahead. Thank you. Thank you, John Warren. Thank you so much for the World Service. Um, <coughs> There's big issues like Brexit and, uh, and Trump and, uh, and all, all sorts of things where Rupert Murdoch has had a phenomenal influence. He's virtually never mentioned on the Today programme. Is that a right, right approach to deal with a man who's more powerful than so many heads of state? Good. Right. Uh, after Rupert Murdoch, we've got here two rows up. Thanks. And Hugh then two rows above, sorry, and then, and then, right, and then we'll go there, right. Hugo Barker, I, I'm a member of the Common Futures Conversation at Chatham House. Right. As a young person, I'm endlessly being chased for my attention mm. uh, across many devices, many technologies, web, so on. Um, how important do you think entertainment is for news? And do you think the BBC should try, be trying to chase entertainment? And does it degrade the work of it when you compare yourself to the CNN and the Fox News of the world mm. with flashy kind of signals and things? Mm. Right, we've got Rupert Murdoch and we've got entertainment, not that they're linked. Right. Um. Uh, hi. I just had a question. There's a lot of talk about impartiality. Uh, and there was a question right now about the World Cup happening, the FIFA World Cup, and the decision that was taken not to show the opening ceremony, which is a global audience, was that to... And then you've gone, gone back to reporting everything about the World Cup. So is that a decision? How does that reflect on influencing? I mean, that's one of the biggest global audience, and you're taking a stance on something and then going back on it to sort of either you don't show anything or you, what was the point of that? Just wondering. Yeah. Um, so let's, start, let's start on that one and then we'll, we'll work backwards. Yeah. That one, uh, we're showing it, we showed it on iPlayer. Uh, we just didn't think it merited broadcast. We've done that before with opening ceremonies. Um, so uh, we're, we're, we're flat out in terms of our coverage <laughs> on the World Cup. I think it's absolutely right, by the way, that we do that journalistic work and we absolutely we, we show the context of the competition. So I've got no problem with where we're at, just to be clear. Um, and I think we'll, 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 we'll go at both from a sporting point of view, but there's also stories in that World Cup that are important to report. So um, uh, just on that, and I know it was before your time, but do you regret uh, that I, the Beeb and other broadcasters uh, didn't uh, ask the same questions it's asking of Qatar uh, when the World Cup was in Russia? four years ago, so we already I, I, invaded Ukraine I, I and I wasn't running it. Um, I think you can look back on some of these things and say, 
could we have done more? Mm. Maybe. Well, we did a hu- I was there. We did a huge amount. I yeah. mean, we, the 2018 World Cup, I mean, I covered the World Cup and I happen to be a big football fan, but, but the lead up to the World Cup, we were actually, I was physically abused in the streets by England fans in Nizhny Novgorod because they told me that the BBC had been so, ba- been so negative about Russia that no England fans had come to the World Cup. Mm. So, and, I, and then later I was abused because everyone was having such a great time. They said, why, did, why were you so kind of, you know, down on Russia? And I was kind of like, uh, I mean, so there was a huge amount of, um, of coverage of, of problems in Russia ahead of the World Cup. And it was, it was actually a way for us to get quite a lot of stuff on air. But um, it was also um, something that we were massively uh, um, criticized for by the Russian government, because obviously for them it was a, ma- a huge party for Putin. Mm. And, <laughs> And it was a great party, and Russia knows how to throw an amazing party and show its best face to the world, and it absolutely did it. But we tried to show what was behind that, as well as showing that Russia does have this great front and, and you know, great culture, great people, but it also has this dark side as well. I mean, on, on the Murdochs, I think, you know, one is if you're the editor of Today programme, you can talk about the Murdochs as much as you like. I, I think there's, a, there's two things I'll say. I mean, you're talking to the broadcaster that broadcast the documentary on the Murdochs, um, so how much do you want? Um, the, there's more. I mean, you know, okay, it's getting into an obsession. But the 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 other thing is, um, you know, I, I also think there's something about the influence of the papers and, and how where they stop and start, which is an interesting question in of itself, by the way, at the moment. So that's another area. Um, but I I I don't think there's any restraint on the BBC going after that story in, as, uh, in, in, a, in appropriate as it should do. Um, the, the question on entertainment <laughs> news is really interesting, one that's pretty live in the newsroom actually, because. If we just want to get reach, then you know the traditional kind of cat falling off. It's often when you go to the BBC news site, you can get slightly kind of uh, depressed. Might be the wrong word, but there's always that story, isn't there? That's kind of like the crazy story or whatever. You watch it, and then you can see it's the most watched. Yeah. yeah. So there is something going on, which is that ability. My personal view is we've got to hold true to what not just prioritise reach not just go for entertainment and tittle-tattle and hold our standards. But there are certain things in the grammar of how we do, how we write headlines, how we create short form, how we use our graphics. So, you know, summarises in a few minutes. What you don't want to do is stuck wholly in an old-fashioned linear form. And I think you have to do a degree, accept that game, use some of its dynamics without diluting your standards. Not easy, debated, daily in the in the BBC newsroom, but, but we're not going to just go off to reach at all costs, because then you just end up losing your soul. But quite a few BBC journalists privately complain that there's a lot on the homepage of the website that does look like clickbait. And it's not the BBC is not competing in the same commercial world as newspapers where 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 clicks, I, I, where I, clicks I, I, matter. Honestly John, I don't buy it. And and uh, everyone can find a journalist unsourced. Um, uh, so, so in my life, the, the, I, I think I, I think actually we've we've been to warm slightly, move towards you slightly. I think we've done a, we've done some work recently on just constantly improving that. So you you mm. keep. I think there are teams, and they, often when you go slightly away from news, where you are under the enormous pressure as the question to get traffic. Yeah, I have to get reach to justify the license fee. The license fee is supported not because we are a good thing. We are a good thing, by the way. We're very good for the creative economy. We're critical to the UK, etc. But it's not why the licence fee is paid. It's paid by a household, mm. by people who use the BBC. Usage supports the BBC. You will only get a market failure BBC, a much smaller BBC, if its only argument is we're good. You know, go have fun. The musical is in the corner. <laughs> no, I'm really serious about this. We are. We are a mass usage intervention, which is wonderful. That's what's so good. That's why when I go and sit in front of other broadcasters and public service, they go, how do you do it? And the reason is usage. So you have to obsess about entertaining. And guess who came up with Inform, Educate, Entertain? It's 100 years ago. Good line. Yeah? And, and Reith saw that. We need to see that. And we need to entertain. It's a really important question. Right, first of all, apologies to all those of you online. I'm, I, there's a lot of questions there. I'm just going to have to prioritise because we've got about another million questions here. And we're only going to get through another three or four. So I'm only going to take three no. or four more from, from the hall. Uh, lady there. Yeah. Um, Tim, you said um, earlier that the Foreign Office had to decide how much it wanted the World Service mm. and what it wanted, you know, how it wanted to support mm. it. 
Where are you concerned that strategically you are underweight around the world? So when you go to the Foreign Office, what are the places you say that you need to be strengthened? Because certainly I have a view, traveling in Africa, traveling in Central America, that China, Russia were way ahead of us. Every hotel room you went yeah. to, that yeah. was the first broadcast you got. Yeah. Let, let's hold on to that gentleman. He's been very patient. Um, there are the two words tonight which came to everyone's attention. The truth, battle for the truth, and also impartiality. Now, in the relation, if you call it uh, Rome, the jury would like to hear the truth. The judge has to act impartially. Now, as far as the BBC is concerned, in relation to the war in the Ukraine, it has been reported only on one side, on the side of the Ukraine. We have never heard why the Russians have invaded Ukraine. OK. Uh, we'll, we'll get um, uh, we'll do those Sarah. Yeah, let's, uh, let's just get the gentleman here, because we've got the microphone here. And then okay. we'll do one more round after that. Uh, gentleman there's got his hand up. The, the answer to Lillian's questions at the beginning is yes, yes. Uh, I've listened to the BBC for 80 years. And during the Second World War, you certainly weren't, uh, you were partisan. And quite rightly so. Uh, my question is this. Uh, does the BBC always tell the truth? And when it does not, do, what do you do about it? There's a really good remark about the, the Second World War, which yes. I think it merits when you face an existential battle to be reductive, good versus evil, what do you do? Is Ukraine, Russia in the, the same league uh, so let's let's answer those those two Sarah um, I, I just want to answer the question yeah. about yeah. why we're not reporting yeah. on Russia's yeah. Si yeah. side if you like uh, of this I, I mean I think that's unfortunately I have to disagree with you politely because we have a Moscow correspondent we did have two but we've only got one now due to circumstances beyond my control but um, Steve Rosenberg is our now, edit, now promoted to Russia editor, um, still doing an extremely good job in Russia, where very few journalists are, are still operating. So you know he's, he's navigating a, a pretty difficult place to be journalistically at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's on air almost every single day on the 6 o'clock and 10 o'clock news and Today program. So um, there are restrictions in Russia about where we can go. Well, I can't go anywhere in Russia, but where the BBC can go. Um, for example, we are banned from the inverted commas, DNR, LNR. So going to Donetsk is, is, is not an option, generally speaking. We've been banned for many years from going there. So um, if you're saying we're not inside the Russian-occupied areas of Ukraine and reporting from there on what's happening, that's for an objective reason that we're not allowed into those regions. Um, I, I would just, if you Google um, Steve interviewing Lavrov, it's an mm. exceptional piece. It is. It's a proper interview. Um, uh, I think it's world class. It's absolutely the Russian perspective. To Sarah's point, We'd be on the ground with the Russian troops safely if we could, as it were, um, but we, we, you can't get in there. So, but, but, so but, I, but think, I, I think our efforts are very significant to give the Russian perspective, very significant. And I, mean, I would I, argue um, that by having, using me occasionally <laughs> in Ukraine, I am trying to explain exactly. what's happening from a Russian perspective, but that doesn't mean reflecting what the Kremlin's saying as truth. It means interrogating what the Kremlin's saying because I'm on the ground in Ukraine watching what the Kremlin is doing in Ukraine. So I think that's just as, val as valid uh, uh, a reporting of, of Russia um, to use someone with 30 years' experience of Russia in Ukraine as it is to have a, you know, somebody in Donetsk. I, I, I in think Donetsk. that's a very, very good point, actually. And we do have a Russian service. I don't know if you speak Russian. Uh, and we've been using it domestically in order to put through what, what the Russian viewpoint to some extent. Not that they do adopt the Russian viewpoint, but they can explain it in the same way yeah. as, as and our the correspondents. World service, not the Russian and, service, but, the, but there are Russian, the world Russian service politicians. In <laughs> yes, exactly. What about just, um, it's too big a question to, to answer simply, but this point about the existential threat, the Second World War. Um, you That's could almost translate question. it now into good climate. Question. We are, yeah, we are facing good an question. existential threat on climate. Um, mm. How mm. do you, Lillian, how, I mean, just a, f a few sort of uh, headline points. Obviously, we, it, 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 we could be talking about that for an hour. But how do you navigate that question where um, freedom is under threat? That's a very good question. That's a very difficult question. Far easier on the climate uh, change yeah. front because this is, it's a given. 
we know what is happening to the world and we broadcast and report accordingly. When it comes to, when it comes to Syria, say, just picking an example, where freedom is of course under threat, where you've got a dictator who's sitting there and who is, um, you know, uh, uh, killing his own people. Do you not, do you not get an interview with Assad if you've got the opportunity to do so? Because you think that something like this, uh, uh, an interview with a dictator like this, is going to work against our liberal values and democracy. Do you, what, what would you do? Would you say, I don't want to hear from him? All I want to hear from is are, are the opposition, the fighters, etc. I, I want to hear from him. And I want to hear from him because I want you, as the audience, to hear what comes from uh, these people as well as from the opposition, similarly with Ukraine, similarly with Iran. It is absolutely essential and crucial that we hear from all these perspectives because I trust that our audience is intelligent enough, is acute enough, and is thorough enough to be able to absorb and to, uh, and to process. So putting someone like Assad on air, putting Lavrov on air, putting Putin on air will only help the cause of liberal democracy and freedom rather than hinder it. That's what I think. Um, there was the lady's point there, that just the one about... Mm. That, that, that's a very difficult one because we do have a very wide footprint. What we don't have, that Russia today have, and the Chinese, is, are the resources and the yeah. money. So yes, I mean, I'm sure that Yusuf would also agree with me that wherever you go on the African continent, you've got Chinese TV everywhere, as you've just said, and similarly with Russia today. We cannot compete resource-wise with Russia Today and CGTN. And, and this is to our detriment, perhaps, but this is, you know, this, this is where we are stuck. It's depth more than breadth, yeah. is the answer. So we're not looking at territories going, we must be there, we're not there. It's, bre it's depth. I mean, would we it's, love it's to be there? Of course we would love to be there. Yeah. A gentleman there who's almost jumping up and down for wanting to ask a question. Hi. Hi. And we'll, we'll take a couple more, and then we just want to stop. And apologies yeah. to everybody whose questions we can't take. Yeah. I, I may be unique in the audience. I moved to London recently because of the BBC, because wow. of World Service wow. and then Radio 4, which I love. You moved, it, it, you it, moved it, from America, right? right? I've got a trail that I'm making. It's a <laughs> testimonial Terrific. featuring yourself. Tes so that's testimonial. Fantastic. Thank you. And my favorite program, when I was in New York, only watching BBC, I closed off all American media because it just was impossible, uh, except for some of the RT shows uh, that had Chomsky and others. Anyway, uh, the point is this. Why did you cancel the crown jewel of BBC, Dateline London? And do you miss it personally? <laughs> yeah, I've heard this a lot. OK, this Dateline, and uh, lady here, uh, just, just here in the third row. And I'm afraid we're just going to have to stop there. And I'm sorry I'm to I'm everybody else. It better be good. Oh, geez, no pressure. OK, hi. Um, so I'm basically just wondering, I'm Canadian. My friends and family are Canadian. I've been living here for years. When they're watching the situation unfolding in, uh, in the UK, and <laughs> Oops, sorry. And uh, you're speaking about, you know, brand Britain. What is what is brand Britain? What does that look like now? And what does that look like uh, in the years ahead? Because looking at the kind of political situation and everything unfolding, uh, it seems a little messy. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good. That's a good. That's a kind of full circle way of ending. Um, Dateline. Why was it closed? It seemed. I mean, in, in pounds and pence, it was fairly cheap to put on. Why? John, do you want to answer why we've closed yeah. Dateline UK? Yeah. The Microphone. Thanks. This is going to be the ultimate. It wasn't my job. Um, uh, I think it was felt that uh, as a format, it had, it had sort of run its course. It, it, it had certainly you know, explored many issues over many years with a variety of guests. But actually, you know, over time, we have developed new formats. And some of the new formats we developed, particularly in the television sphere, like Ros Atkins explanations mm -hmm. and other areas like that, is where we think we can actually meet a greater audience need at the moment and through basically a panel discussion program that had really explored that format, I think, over many years successfully. But new ones were, were needed 
particularly in the context of this discussion around the battle for truth. So how else do we more quickly get at the truth than a forensic long form report over five minutes on a single issue, which we're able to service on a variety of platforms, be it a social platform or our own on demand platforms like iPlayer, and indeed on, on the world service itself. So I think it was really, we can't carry on making everything in the same way that we have. It's time to try new things. Okay. So on that final question, I'll just slightly uh, add to it as my final question to all of you. We've talked a lot about the battle for truth, democracy, brand Britain, uh, why the BBC is absolutely central to it. Why, therefore, are you required constantly to be cutting, salami slicing, and you're not getting your message through to government ministers? What is it that they don't get? <laughs> Come on. Well, I think the, the, the I, I have mixed views to that question, which is, I think, I, I will give you the, the kind of stock answer to a point, which is we're incredibly privileged to have the licence fee. Mm. You know, it, with, with household income where it is, you know, by law, £159. Now, we justify that. It's actually quite a market model in some ways. You have to justify that. And the fact that we've got security of revenue for two years flat and four years at CPI is something that... I am. Um, I, I think we're. I think it's a good thing. I think it's a good thing to have that stability. And by the way, around the world, if you look at public service broadcasting, it is in crisis. To mm. be clear, its funding's in crisis. I would also say, look at the traditional media market is in serious trouble in terms of its economics, whether that's papers, linear television companies. So be careful. You know, every it, every institution is going through enormous pain. Second thing is, and I'm the corporate man here, that not everything you hear about that we're closing is pure cuts, all right? It is re-moving -mo money around. So not everything that we move, we, we, want, we think we need to move at least, you know, kind of 500 million around the organization, of which about 200 million is cuts, pure cuts, 300 million is things we're stopping because we think we, you know, it is, it is to John's point, it's an editorial organization. So you have to kill things and start things, and that can be really painful. And we don't do much bad stuff, so people care about it. Yeah, having said that, the, the fact is that public finances are under enormous pressure, but I think the, lo the long-term disinvestment in the BBC has been a really bad move for the UK. Yeah, we, we, we have lost, you know, significant, over 10 years, about 30% in real, I mean, cut after cut. Now, the BBC, has gone through efficiency. I mean, I come from a commercial background. Now, if, if you benchmark our costs, and we do, this, you can't, it no longer say the BBC's got 100 people over. You literally bench, look at the external benchmarks. We're pretty lean, number of HR people, number of cent I mean, it's pretty vigorous now how we're doing it. I think we've reached a point of choice around the creative industries and the BBC, which is we cannot continue to just take money out and expect to defy gravity. I think that point is exacerbated by a transition and the capital required to move from a linear organization to a digital organization. Because the point about Africa and everything is we're having to shut things to get digital. You have to be ready for digital. You don't have to be the biggest digital evangelist. We still, radio is still going to be huge. TV is going to be huge. But we need the capital to do that transition. I think we should be invested in. Now, we're doing all we can with our commercial arm, 1.6 billion turnover, grown 60%. But that does not really make a massive difference in terms of the overall public funding and what we need to do. So the answer to your question, John, is I think there are political realities around what the economics of the country are, public spending. I, I don't think, um, I think you have some ideology around a public intervention of this nature. My personal view is it's, a, it's an incredibly enlightened blend between public and private institutions working together to grow the creative industries. And I think we need more investment. Um, and I think people have been used to salami slicing, if I can be blunt, and continuing to, for us to defy gravity. So there's always a case of you can just do a bit more and it'll all be fine. There will be a point, and we begin to prove it, where that is not the case. And I think, my, my, as I lead the BBC, by the way, what I won't do is just thin everything out by 5% or 3% or 10% now. That doesn't work. You have to stop doing stuff. And that's why we are doing certain things where people are saying, well, what do you mean you're stopping certain services? because we have to. And we do have a choice in terms of we can keep this thing going at scale for a while, but we're going to have to invest harder. 
That's a good point to end. That's a clarion call. Uh, just a, a thank you to the events team here at Chatham House. Thank you to Juliet and Dan at the BBC. It's, it's taken um, some time to get this uh, event happening. And boy, I think it was, um, I've certainly learnt a, a huge amount. I, apologies to those whose questions we were not able to take, both in the hall and online. I've broken a Chatham House cardinal rule, which is to go over an hour, an hour and 15, but we do have to, to stop there. So please, everybody, give a, a warm thanks to Sarah, to Lillian and to Tim.